The terrorist attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon changed our world forever and launched an international crisis. As a result, people are even now asking questions about the fate of planet Earth and searching for answers. Some are looking to best-selling books on prophecy and movies with apocalyptic themes, but many of these focus on a future rapture, a future tribulation, a future Jewish temple, and a future antichrist. However, in doing so, could they be ignoring a very real and present danger? Today we begin a series called The Antichrist Chronicles with international speaker and author Steve Wahlberg. In this and other episodes to follow, we hope to uncover in the annals of history and in the pages of the biblical record hidden secrets pertaining to this very mysterious subject of the Antichrist. Now let's join Steve as we begin our journey into the Antichrist Chronicles. I'm sure you've heard the story of the Titanic. It's an amazing drama. In the year 1912, a supposedly unsinkable ship began its fateful journey across the Atlantic from England to New York. The first four days were about, uh, well, basically I could say they were smooth sailing. The sky was clear. The water was smooth, no problems. But on that fateful fifth day, in the year 1912, actually took place in the evening, at about 20 minutes to midnight, the Titanic hit the ice. And within three hours, she was underwater, on her way down, down, down to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean with approximately half of her passengers still on board. Now, the reason why I begin this special series talking about the Titanic is because there is another major Titanic subject found in the pages of God's book, and that is the subject of the Antichrist. This is one of the hottest, one of the most controversial topics that, that we can ever study. And we're going to look at this. We're going to focus on it. We're going to talk about who the Antichrist is or what the Antichrist is, who, what, when, where, why, how come, and ultimately, so what? What does it have to do with you and with me? So are you ready for this? Are you really ready? Uh, sometimes when I hold my seminars, I encourage people to put their seatbelts on, and I would say you need about five of them for this series, the Titanic, Titanic subject of the Antichrist. We're going to study this series, in this series, entirely from this book, God's book, the Holy Bible. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to 1 John. 1 John, and what we're going to do in uh, just a moment is we're going to have a prayer because as we get into, into a subject like this, the biblical subject of the Antichrist, I can't think of anything better to do at the beginning of a drama like this than to bow our heads, lift up our hearts, and ask for the Lord to be with us and to help us. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, let's begin with prayer, so let's bow our heads. Uh, please pray with me. Let's ask for the blessing of God. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this chance to be here with so many people and to study your word and to talk about this big subject, not only about the Antichrist, but about Jesus Christ. And we pray at the beginning of this amazing drama, we ask for your presence and for the Holy Spirit to be right here with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, here we go. The Antichrist. When most Christians today think about the subject of the Antichrist, they think about some mysterious man, a mysterious person, possibly half man, half devil, who will rise up at the end of time and take over the world. This is the common view when people think about this awesome topic. The Left Behind novels, which are sweeping the country right now, being read by Christians all over America, swirl around this entire subject of the Antichrist. How many of you have read some of these books, some of the Left Behind books? Let me just see a few hands. Okay, I see quite a few hands. Uh, my wife and I have, we've got all of them, and we've been going through them one by one. I can't say I've read every word. She's read all of them, but I've read a lot. Uh, the Left Behind books first came out in the year 1995, written by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. They went to the top of the charts, books about Bible prophecy. They're novels. 
They went to the top of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. Barnes & Noble even voted this series to be the best-selling series of all time. And here's one of the books, and I've got another one here. These books, the Left Behind novels, surround the subject of the Antichrist. In fact, book number, number three is called Nikolai, which is all about this mysterious person, the Antichrist. When you read the books, the novels, they talk about this man, Nikolai Carpathia. Uh, he is the person that Jerry Jenkins has portrayed with such skill as someone that might represent, or at least someone that would illustrate what the Antichrist might be like. At the introduction of the Tribulation Force, this is number two of the Left Behind books. It talks about this man, and it says, he is one of the most powerful and charismatic personalities ever, the mysterious Romanian leader, Nikolai Carpathia. Within two weeks of the vanishings, referring to the rapture, Carpathia was swept to international power as head of the United Nations, promising to unite the devastated globe into one peaceful village. When you read the Left Behind books, and actually a movie came out February 2nd, 2001. The movie came out. The budget was $17 million. It was watched by Christians all over America. Uh, when you watch this movie, or if, you, if you've seen it, it talks about Nikolai, the Antichrist. And when you watch this or read about him, he looks like a very nice guy. On the outside, he's compassionate. He appears to be humble. But as you continue to read about him, ultimately it becomes pretty clear that he is indwelt by the devil himself. He is really an evil man. He is the evil antichrist described in the Bible. He talks compassionately, but inside Satan himself is working and moving. Now, as I mentioned, these are fictitious uh, novels, but they describe the kind of person that many people envision the Antichrist will be, an evil person, a wicked person, possessed by the devil. Now, because a lot of Christians these days are wondering how close we are to the coming of Jesus, and I'm one of the Christians in this world that believes that the coming of the Lord is getting closer. I don't know about you, but I believe Jesus is soon to return. And because of this, and a lot of Christians feel this way in different denominations around the world, Baptist, Methodist, uh, Assemblies of God, Presbyterians, Adventists, Lutherans, all kinds of different Christians are sensing we're getting closer to Jesus coming. And so what's happening is many people are starting to look around and they're starting to, maybe I should say, speculate as to who this Antichrist might be and they're wondering if maybe he is here now. Now, it's amazing when you, when you do a little bit of research on this, some of the possible candidates for this Antichrist. And I'll just show you the first one. Uh, this is rather humorous, but believe it or not, there's a lot of people, maybe I shouldn't say a lot of people, but there are some people that believe that David Hasselhoff, who is the star of Baywatch, the popular television series, that he's the Antichrist. If you go on the internet and type in under some search engine, Antichrist, many times it'll take you right to his site. And uh, if you look closely, if you look closely at his face there, <laughs> this is from the website. Now, why, did, why does this person think that Hasselhoff might be the Antichrist? This person uh, muses that because he comes out of the sea, at least in the television series, the Pacific Ocean, the Bible says that the beast comes out of the sea also. And the Bible says the beast has ten horns, and so this person speculates that David does have ten very popular songs, and maybe there's a connection there. Uh, he also mentions that the Bible does talk about Antichrist rising out of Europe, and David is from guess where? He's European. He's originally from, from Germany. Now, not a lot of people take this seriously, obviously. But there are other people, other potential candidates that people do take a lot more seriously. And one of them is Mikhail Gorbachev, the former president of the uh, former Soviet Union. Some people think that he might be the Antichrist. Some books have been written about this. If you take a look closely at his picture here, you see this little mark on his forehead, the little birthmark. Some people connect that and they think, well, this might be a little preliminary warning to us that he's going to enforce the mark of the beast on people's foreheads. So this is another, another speculative idea. Now, then there's another person, and that is Bill Gates. 
Some people have come to the conclusion that Bill Gates might be the Antichrist because the Bible talks about the time when nobody can buy or sell unless he has the marks, the mark of the beast, and there might be a connection between computers and the mark. And so some people think Bill Gates, he's the perfect, perfect picture of the Antichrist. And then there's another one, and that's Charles V. Charles V in, in, from Wales in England. Uh, there's actually a book written about him called The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea by Tim Cohen, giving lots of reasons why this person believes that, yes, he really could be the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, of course, nobody really knows, no Christian really knows exactly uh, who this person might be. They're speculating. But when you put all these different pieces together, all these different potential candidates, one thing people seem to be pretty sure of today is that whoever he is, he will be somebody like Nikolai Carpathia, some charismatic, brilliant, political person rising up in the Middle East uh, after the rapture. This is the common understanding of whoever this person might be. Now, what we're going to do in this series is we're going to open up our Bibles and find out what the Bible actually says. Does that sound like a good, good idea? Okay, now, if you're taking notes, you might want to just jot this down, that the word antichrist is actually only used five times in the Bible. And all of those times are found in 1 John and 2 John. So let's open our Bibles to 1 John, and let's go through these verses. We're going to look at them quickly. We have a lot to do. Uh, an ancient Chinese wise man once said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with how many steps? The first step, right? So we've got to take our first step, and we've got to go into this. Now, actually, what we're going to do, before we read about Antichrist, we're going to read about Jesus Christ in 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And the reason why we're going to do this is because I really believe strongly in my heart that the only way to really understand Antichrist is to understand Jesus Christ. So let's take a look. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. John is writing to the early Christians. He wrote, and to us he's writing, My little children, these things write I to you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, who is the Father? He's talking about God, our Heavenly Father, and who is our advocate or our mediator? The Bible says it's Jesus. Now, believe it or not, and we'll get into this more as we continue to study, that this whole issue of Jesus being our advocate, our mediator up there, representing us as our Savior, this is a vital issue in understanding the Antichrist, which we'll, we'll make this clear as we go along. So Jesus is our advocate. In other words, if we sin, we can come right to the Father through Jesus. He loves us. He will forgive us. He will save us by his grace. Isn't that good news? That's the good news of the Bible. Now let's keep going. In verse 2, John continues and says that he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now the, the word propitiation, some Bibles say propitiation, others say sacrifice. How many of your Bibles say sacrifice? Okay, good. A lot. How about, how about pro propitiation? Okay, I see a lot of hands. You must be reading the King James, like I'm reading the King James Bible. This verse is telling us that Jesus Christ not only is our advocate, but he is also our sacrifice. And now these two points are very, very important because 1 John gives us the context and the background for the whole subject of the Antichrist. In other words, if we sin, we come to Jesus, he's our mediator. And the reason why he's our mediator is because 2,000 years ago on a cruel cross, he gave his life as our sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He's our advocate, and he's our sacrifice. Are you with me? Those are two vital, fundamental points. Okay, now let's keep going. Now, if you look at verse 18, this is the very first verse in the New Testament that talks about the subject of the Antichrist directly, at least where the word itself is used. Let's take a look. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John wrote, Little children, it is the last time as you have heard that Antichrist, there's the first reference, shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. Now, this is our first text, and this verse is amazing. It tells us, first of all, as we just look at the Bible, what does the Bible actually say? It tells us that there is not just one Antichrist. Do you see that in your Bibles? Now, when does John say these many antichrists will come? 
Does he say they're only coming in the future? John said in this verse, if you look at it, he said even, and what's that next word? Even now. Now, when did John write this? He wrote this about 2,000 years ago. So John said, even now are there many antichrists. So the idea of there being only one person called the antichrist only, so far, that verse actually isn't according to the Bible. Now, notice verse 19. Verse 19 is an absolutely amazing passage. Verse 19 says, they, referring to these many antichrists, they went out from, and what's that next word? From us. Right, now what does the word us mean? Uh, who's writing this? This is John, and when he says us, what's he talking about? He's talking about himself as a Christian, and he's talking about other Christians in the early church. And when John says they, referring to these many antichrists in the first century 2,000 years ago, when he said they went out from us, he's saying that these antichrists don't come from outside of Christianity, but they come from the inside. They are apostates from the inside. Do you see that? That's a very, very important point. In other words, antichrists, according to John, come out from within Christianity but they're not really following Jesus Christ. Now let's keep going. That's the second reference. 1 John 2, 18 mentions it twice. Now go down to verse 22. Here's the third reference. Verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is what? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Now here's another important point about Antichrist. Antichrist denies the Father, and the Son. Point number three. Now, if you go to, if you just jot down to verse 26, it'll tell us something else about Antichrist. Uh, verse 26 says, John says, These things have I written to you concerning them that seduce you. Now, who are, who are the them? Them refers to these Antichrists. And John is writing to Christians about the seductive influence of many antichrists that were, that were trying to deceive them 2,000 years ago. So that's another significant verse. Now let's go to chapter 4. Let's take a look at verse 3. Here we have the fourth reference to the antichrist, or at least the word. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. John wrote, Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and we'll talk more about that later in this series. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So here John says that there is a spirit of Antichrist. You see that? Antichrist is not just one man. There are many Antichrists, and there is even a spirit of Antichrist. And the scripture says that that spirit is already in this world. That's important, isn't it? Very important. Now, if you go down to verse 4, verse 4, John continues and says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Now, when he says them, who is he talking about? John is writing to the church, and he, he says, You are of God, little children. In other words, humble Christians trusting in Jesus. And then he says, You have overcome them. Now, who is the them? The them refers to these many antichrists. That's right. And then he says, praise the Lord. The reason is, he goes on and says, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. <laughs> so the Lord tells us that there is more power from God that can come into our lives, and through the power of God, we can overcome these many antichrists that try to lead us away from Jesus Christ, from our advocate, from our sacrifice, who died on the cross for everyone. Jesus died for, he died for Baptists, he died for Methodists, he died for Protestants, he died for Catholics, he died for Republicans. Yes, he did die for Democrats. <laughs> he died for President, former President Clinton. He died for President Bush. He died for drug addicts. He, dry, he died for, for the whole world, for Muslims, for Jews, for atheists. 
He died for you and he died for me. Amen? Amen. And through Jesus Christ and through his power and through the spirit working in us, John says you can overcome them. Now, one of the points I really want to make here is according to this verse, who is it that needs to overcome Antichrist? It's Christians, right? Christians need to overcome the Antichrist. Antichrist, many Antichrists, the spirit of Antichrist. All of these verses tell us the same thing. Now, let's go to the last passage about at least where the word Antichrist is used, and that's in 2 John, the seventh verse. 2 John 7, 2 John 7, it's good to hear those pages turning, it's good to see you out there, it's great to be here studying with you. 2 John, this is a little John, you know there's a big John, the Gospel of John, then there's three little Johns, there's 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So here we have our second little John, but there's a big verse in verse 7, John wrote, for many Notice the word many again, deceivers. In other words, uh, Antichrist is, is tricky, it's subtle. Many deceivers are entered into the world, they're here now, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And we'll talk more about this. In fact, we have a whole, a whole subject as part of the Antichrist Chronicles about Antichrist denying that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Hope you, hope you won't miss that meeting. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and what else? And an antichrist. You see that? It says and an antichrist. Now when it says an antichrist, what does that tell us about that word, again, antichrist? It tells us that there is more than just one. Do you see that? It's very clear from the Bible, isn't it? That a person can, can be a deceiver and an antichrist. This is important for us to know, extremely important. That is what the Bible says. The Bible is like a map. It's like a road map that leads us to heaven. Uh, on the screen here, you can see a, a map, and if you had really good eyes, you can see Memphis, Tennessee, right in the middle there, uh, which you probably can't see. But I used to, I don't do it so much anymore, today as I used to do a few years ago, but I used to travel all around the country and even overseas to Russia, Canada, different countries, and I used to hold, uh, hold Bible prophecy seminars. I still do it now when I have a chance. The Lord has led me into a television ministry, so I'm not traveling around as much as I used to be. But one time I had a meeting, and it was in a little place called Corinth, Mississippi. Have you heard of Corinth, Mississippi? Not a big town. And when I flew to this seminar, I landed in Memphis, went to the thrifty rental car place, picked up my car, asked for a map, and talked to the man there, I think it was the manager, and I said, give me the quickest directions to get to Corinth. So he said, sure, you just go out there to the highway, get on Highway 55, and head south, and you'll get there by and by. I knew it was about two hours from, from Memphis. So I followed his directions, I trusted him, I didn't think he would lead me astray, and so I got in my car and started driving on 55, heading south. And after about 15 minutes, and I, I put my map over on the on the passenger seat as I'm driving along. And after about 15 minutes, I had this little voice of conscience talking to me. And the voice was saying, Steve, just make sure and check your map. And I thought, no, I don't need to do that because this man, you know, he lives in this area. He, he was the manager of Thrifty Rental Car. Surely he pointed me in the right direction. And after another 10 minutes, the voice got louder. So finally, I picked up the map and I looked at it as I'm driving along now. I don't recommend that you do this while you're driving on the freeway. And there weren't a lot of cars, so I was driving down, and I looked at the map, and there it was. And I was able to notice that Highway 55 from Memphis, Tennessee, takes you straight down two hours to Jackson, Mississippi. And Corinth was not that way. Corinth was on Highway 72 heading directly, directly east. And when I looked at that, this, the, the Lord, I think it was the Lord, <laughs> convicted my conscience, and I saw it, at least my own mind saw it, that if I would have stayed on Highway 55, folks, I never would have got to Corinth by and by. Never would have got there. So I turned around, got on the right road, and eventually made it to Corinth and had a great seminar there. Now, I always look for little lessons in my life, and one lesson that impressed me very deeply at that time was, no matter how much you trust somebody, no matter how much you think he's sincere and honest, 
Still, we have to take a look at our maps ultimately to make sure we're going in the right direction. Are you with me? And the Bible, this is God's map. And there may be Bible prophecy teachers today, and there's a lot of them, a lot of them very sincere, very honest, uh, godly people. But many times as they tell us things about prophecy, no matter how much we may trust them, it is important that we take a look at our maps ourselves to make sure we're on the right road. Are you with me? Because if we don't take a look at the map ourselves, we will end up most likely on the wrong road. Now, when we just look at our map, let me just summarize what we have studied so far in this first meeting of the Antichrist Chronicles. We learned that according to the Bible, Antichrist is used five times. The scripture says, even now there are many of them. They come out from us, referring to from within the Christian church. Antichrist deny the Father and the Son. There is a spirit of Antichrist, not just one man. Christians need to overcome the Antichrist or Antichrist, and they are subtle and deceptive. Now, all of these truths we have found in our map, which is the Word of God. Isn't that true? All of these truths are right there. Ultimately, Antichrist denies Jesus Christ and leads away from our Savior. And I pray and I hope that God will help us all to follow our maps, to follow Jesus, and I hope you'll stick with me as we keep studying more of the Antichrist Chronicles to find out what prophecy teachers ultimately are not telling us in these final days. We're glad you joined us for this first episode of the Antichrist Chronicles, and we hope you'll join us next time as Steve continues this investigative series with a message entitled Antichrist and the Rapture. We are going to take a close look. We are going to examine what the Bible says about the order of events, about the Antichrist, about the timing, a lot of these issues, many issues, and we're going to do it from God's book. Sound like a good place?